Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're going to talk about 23rd and Union, a docudrama that investigates the 2008 murder of a popular Seattle restaurant owner. The film uses the murder as a vehicle to discuss gentrification and the tensions between young African-American men, Ethiopian immigrants, and gay couples who now reside in Seattle's Central District together. With us today is a talented young filmmaker, Rafael Flores. Rafael, welcome to Backstory. Thank you so much for coming up and joining us from the Bay Area. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you back in Seattle. So um, tell me a little bit about the backstory for yourself on this yeah. film. How did it come to pass? What was your first involvement uh, after the event that got, uh, made it become a film? Yeah. Um, so Philly's Best was a very popular restaurant in the Central District ever since I was born I can remember it's always been right there on the corner of 23rd and Union and um, the owner the original owner was actually murdered um, in the parking lot and then a second owner who was his apprentice who was an mm -hmm. Ethiopian immigrant mm -hmm. named Safi de Sasha mm -hmm. uh, or Saf, sometimes aka Safi Berecha mm -hmm. um, took over the restaurant and uh, he was a beloved figure in the community and he was actually a personal friend of mine and friends of lots of people I know who mm -hmm. lived in the community and he was always known to be very generous and to ver and offer free food to people in the neighborhood to help the homeless and um, he was actually murdered um, in 2008 and when his murder happened actually on the cover of the Seattle Times there was a picture um, of many people from many different backgrounds yeah. and, and cultures that gathered together for his memorial. This was just, this was a photograph of the memorial. The service. photograph of the okay. memorial. And when I saw that picture, it inspired me because it was the first time that I had seen so many different people from so many different backgrounds gathered together. And I thought that if his death could bring so many different people together, that perhaps this film could do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used the word docudrama <laughs> to, to describe the film. I actually think the film is more than that. It's, it's mm -hmm. bigger than that. It has a very unique style. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what led you to thinking about this particular form to tell this story? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the film actually operates as my, um, my master's thesis for mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco State University where yeah. I got my degree in um, cinema production and directing. And as a requisite for that uh, master's thesis, we're supposed to conduct research. And okay. so it started with a lot of interviews <clears throat> with a lot of uh, people in the community that knew the parties involved and who are personal friends of mine and whatnot. And so as I was gaining my research throughout this project, um, it was always intended to be a narrative. But then what happened was is that I started to realize that a lot of the adaptations that I was creating actually were ending up to be true through my interviews with the people in the community. And so, in a way, in an attempt to have the form fit the content, which yeah. in my opinion, most great films do, yeah. um, I tried to create several different worlds in the film, three different worlds to be specific. Mm -hmm. The documentary world, the narrative world, the fictional yeah. world, and an in-between surreal world, which actually is aimed to actually challenge the spectator to uh, question the representations of various stereotypes that you see throughout the film and to look behind the truth and look at yourself and look in the mirror and see what role we all play in gentrification and how that affects youth uh, such as Rico, our main character, or mm -hmm. aka Ray Davis Bell, who committed the murder and to, for us to all really be accountable for the violence and the actions that take place in our city and in our communities. So these three points of emphasis came together and sort of were your guide in putting the film together, these mm -hmm. distinct areas that you were focusing on. As you went through the project, and I can only imagine, you know, once you get on the ground and begin to encounter the real people and mm -hmm. you have a personal connection to it, things must have changed. Things must have revealed themselves that you didn't expect. What, what were some of the things that surprised you in going in and making this film that you just didn't expect when you first went in? That's a good question. Um, so the first thing that I didn't really expect was how defensive a lot of the community actually were with the representation of their own communities. Okay. And I think that it's interesting when you look at gentrification because essentially everybody's competing for their own community's resources and space. And yes. that's essentially every scene in the film is about competition for space and resources. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, when I was casting, I spent two, two months casting for this film, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see that, first of all, a lot of African-American men 
did not feel comfortable playing gay characters. Okay. I also thought that it was interesting that a lot of Ethiopian um, actors uh, weren't as excited or motivated to actually act in a film because in immigrant communities it's often not viewed as an acceptable profession okay. um, because you know as many immigrant families and parents want their children to come mm -hmm. to the United States to live the American dream to become a lawyer mm -hmm. or a doctor or an engineer and so um, it was surprisingly difficult to find actors uh, for the film and that was one of the challenges but also uh, the role of the Seattle Police Department was also a very interesting role and surprise to me mm -hmm. um, because during the the production of the film the police were called on us about five different times even though we had permits from the yeah. city of Seattle that guaranteed that the Seattle Police Department was informed about the production yet the neighbors in the community kept on calling the police on us even after we had actually consulted them and informed them that there would be a production going on. We're producing this film we have our permits uh, the city is aware of it and yet they're calling the police. Mm -hmm. And in general I think that it's important to recognize that because the lack of neighborly yeah. uh, sentiment yeah. in, in, in the neighborhood is actually precisely what this film is about. Well it's interesting because what we're talking about is you know so much of the tension in the film is about specific cultures colliding in one space and a filmmaker going into that community represents yet another culture mm -hmm. a culture with eyes and ears that's looking to find the truth and of course people are going to be protective and very concerned about their own self-image on film. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately though you did end up right in the community making this. I mean your mm -hmm. locations are real. Uh, you're not shooting things on sound stages even though there's drama and fiction in it. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's definitely a, a part of the reality there. Yeah. So um, what was the sort of experience once you got there and, and you know did it turn around? Was there a point where, oh, you know, we 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 maybe misunderstood this? Uh, how, in other words, how much time did you spend when you're making this? And then the, the, let me sort of follow up on that because, mm -hmm. you know, the first few days there's these strangers in town. They're doing this. Did it change over time? Did people begin to welcome you and? Mm -hmm. uh, open up a little more? Well first off I was born and raised in the Central District mm -hmm. so uh, people know me there and okay. our media collective Green Eyed Media was co-founded or it was founded in Seattle in 2006 okay. so the presence of Green Eyed Media in the Central District was very well known. Um, oftentimes I have my crew wear you know some of the fashion that we have for, um, which have our logo on yeah. our shirts and whatnot and so um, and I would say pretty much everybody was very excited and always very interested in what we were doing and yeah. what we were shooting, especially considering the fact that we were shooting right there on the corner of 23rd exactly. and Union, yeah. um, which is completely transformed now, doesn't look the same by the way. Um, and so there was a kind of um, rush and, and imperative sense of trying to complete the film before the entire building was remodeled yeah. um, to remember, to, 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 to pay tribute to Safi and his, and his uh, restaurant and always remind people of his legacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there on 23rd and Union you're filming and uh, uh, so your sense is that the concerns from the community really were about fear of how they'd be depicted? Is that what you'd say? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I think that in particular the people who participated in the film who were actually witnesses to the murder. Yes. Were deaf. It was a very traumatic experience for them and to go back and revisit these memories was kind of operating as a therapeutic exercise okay. for themselves but also for myself um, and my relationship to my community after seeing so many of African American families and friends of mine that had actually had their houses foreclosed and had to move further south into mm -hmm. areas of Tacoma and Kent. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a therapeutic exercise in terms of me um, confronting the frustration I've had and essentially feeling like an alien in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. and constantly mm -hmm. being profiled everywhere you walk through. Right, right. Now I'm not going to give it away but y you know you touched a little earlier on uh, the police uh, uh, being called on you. There's also a scene where you depict an encounter with the Seattle police. Mm -hmm. Did you have to go through anything specific to uh, make that happen in terms of uh, you know using their image if you will on mm -hmm. camera? Absolutely. Uh, the Seattle Film Department um, <laughs> was a bit concerned about that when I when I kind of proposed this idea, and um, the police didn't like it. They don't like the way that they're portrayed in the film. But I, I always reminded people that when we made the film, it was actually right after the murder of four police officers 
in the area, actually. And it was also right after a young woman was punched in the face by the police so the police department right in front of Philly's Best where we shot the film a which week Which is before, in the film. Which is in the film. Yeah. Um, so definitely, I think that there, the city of Seattle probably didn't like the portrayal mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. for instance, the bus, uh, the, the metro yeah. transit system as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm the type of filmmaker that uh, I have to speak my mind, and I yeah. didn't make this film for any type of profit at all. I made it because it was a film that needed to be made, it, made at the time, and I think that I, I can't censor myself in any way. It's so you doggedly pursue the idea of having to, for example, shoot on that bus. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the tipping point? How do you get permission for that? Did, is this something that you had to just, you know, did you steal a bus in order to do this? I mean, how did you ultimately convince the people yeah. we're talking about to come around and say, okay, you know, go ahead, you can use it, yeah. uh, as opposed to just no chance, we're not going to let you uh, well, depict us at all? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a form of community filmmaking, first of all. And I think that if these institutions were not going to allow us to do that, uh -huh. Then I'm the type of filmmaker that would directly insert that narrative into the story uh -huh. and the process of filmmaking itself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, and and that beyond that, I think that for the most part, the the, the institutions were very understanding of it. Okay. And I think that in Seattle, people understand that artists need to express themselves, and okay. the things that we're talking about are realities that I don't think many people can deny. Right. Well, before we look at the film, Raphael. Um, as I said in the beginning, you live in the Bay Area, but you have very close ties because you grew up uh, in the Central District, but you also have uh, close ties to the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I grew up on the University of Washington's campus. Uh, my father is the chair of American Ethnic Studies here, and so I would always sit in on a lot of his classes. And at an early age, I was exposed to a lot of Chicano cinema, um, mm -hmm. which is what he specializes in, and it actually, in order to actually study that, I, I was enrolled into um, the Comparative Literature and Cinema Studies Department here. Okay. Um, and at the time, there wasn't really many outlets for filmmakers to actually practice filmmaking in the university setting because of the lack of a traditional film school here and right. also the lack of an MFA program right. also in the state of Washington. So. Um, after I finished my studies here at the University of Washington, I actually had to move to California to get to, to pursue that degree, the MFA, mm -hmm. um, so I could teach. And so a combination of influence of watching Chicano film through your father's uh, 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 classes mm -hmm. and uh, your own interest in cinema here at the University of Washington results in the filmmaker Rafael Flores. Absolutely. What other influences? What are their influences? So during my, and that's actually something that's very interesting because the cinema studies department here at University of Washington has a great national, national cinema program. Mm -hmm. And so I took a lot of Filipino cinema, a lot of Russian cinema, a lot of Latin American cinema. And this led me to um, discover the third cinema movement from a particular professor named uh, Kiko Benitez here mm -hmm. on the campus. And Kiko, uh, I, did, uh, I did my undergraduate honors thesis with him and I studied the relationship between third cinema in, and producing that in the first world. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't really know what third cinema is, it's actually a cinema that decries neocolonialism as a form of filmmaking uh, or neocolonialistic filmmaking mm -hmm. practices as a form of spectacle and something that impedes collective action. And yeah. so many of my films and much of my work is an attempt to create third cinema within the first world and particular reference to the idea of internal colonialism and how mm -hmm. gentrification operates as an internal mechanism mm. of segregating people but also um, developing small colonies of, and dividing and conquering communities of color. You know, this is, a, this is a, a topic that ranges into the area of, you know, what we call the democratization of media in our time. Meaning that, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started rolling the cameras about, you know, when I was your age, um, it was a very departmentalized, institutionalized training, obviously with film cameras and expense, uh, the difficulty of acquiring equipment and crew, uh, all of those factors were, were barriers. Mm -hmm. Now, almost anyone that can get themselves to a Best Buy can get their hands on a pretty decent video camera. And then we've also seen that distribution and control of the content has changed. I mean, we saw that 
in the last decade with the music business, the mm -hmm. demise of the labels and artists directly communicating to their audiences. Well, you know, now with Vimeo and YouTube and all the outlets, filmmakers are now able to directly access and communicate with their audiences. Would you say that has been a, a major influence on how you think about making and putting your work out in the world? Absolutely. Um, so one thing that I like to remind people is that even though we have this digital revolution and cameras are easily accessible, for a lot of communities and young people of color, you might as well be saying that's a million dollars because they're not going I myself can't even afford a camera mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I don't own a camera. Mm -hmm. um, so what the important thing in terms of community filmmaking is really depending on your, your peers to help you. Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes a lot of filmmakers trade favors and right. this, this sense of kind of supporting each other and to empower each other and to, to, to collectively speak together is something that's absolutely essential to a lot of my films. And I really don't like to depend on the commercial film industry to support myself because oftentimes you have to take a job that you necessarily don't feel passionate about. Right. And for me, I, I think that filmmaking is really an outlet to really express my, um, my views about the world that I see around me. And oftentimes, because of the commercial pressures, yeah. um, those ideas change. And so so are you, let me get this a little more defined for me. When you say uh, community filmmaking, mm -hmm. you're not just talking about films that deal with community issues. You're also talking about a structure by which the film is made, I'm hearing now. And distributed and, v and screened as well. Okay, can you, can you define some of that for us Absolutely. so I can understand it better? So um, community filmmaking to me is not only just a form of production, but also the way that it's distributed uh -huh. and also screened to the public. And so a lot of the films that I create are actually geared for discussions afterwards. And so 23rd and Union is a perfect example of okay. that. Um, it ha was sold out f it, through a large campaign of grassroots promotions and hitting the streets, passing out flyers, talking to people, having conversations with people. Um, and as a result, it was very successful actually. And it was an alternate mode of kind of distribution as well, because right. when we do this, we actually sell the streets hand to hand directly to the public and, and at the screenings as well. It was also marketed with a soundtrack and the soundtrack actually succeeded in its own right. And um, so these types of strategies are kind of alternate ways for film, uh, independent filmmakers to actually collaborate with musicians as yeah, well to yeah. link the industry. Sort of cross-pollinate and find new ways to help each other. Exactly. And so, you know, we have in our minds in this country, when you think of film premiere, you think of a red carpet mm -hmm. and you think of all the paparazzi. I'm going to guess that the venue itself was somewhat radical as well. I'm guessing you weren't doing premieres like that. Were you in community centers? When you were screening this, what were those? Uh, what was the context yeah, of that? Absolutely. So um, the two largest proponents in terms of screening the film was uh, Langston Hughes, okay. um, Langston Hughes Cultural Center, and their um, annual African American Film Festival, which sponsored the film, um, but also Central Cinema, where it premiered actually, and it was two blocks away from where the actual murder took place. And Central Cinema is a local uh, theater that's meant to support filmmakers from the Central District. And so it, it is an alternate route um, and form of screening to the public. And I think it was very important to premiere the film there because it directly spoke to the population that the film was about. And it served as a space to candidly talk about the issues in the community. Do you, do you by any chance, 30 years ago, Francis Coppola, in an interview, was asked what the future of American cinema was. Do you know what his answer was? This is 30 years ago. What's that? A kid from a small town in Kansas with his own camera. Mm -hmm. Pretty for, for a lot of foresight from him there. Absolutely. Now let's take a look at the trailer for 23rd and Union. Welcome to the CD. That's the Central District, if you don't live here. It would be a, one good way of remembering Safi and at least changing my negative memory to positive. Call the cops, you fucking eat me! I will not be put out of my house, whether you call the inspectors or not. Mrs. Brown, I've been more than patient with you. I've given you two months. That is more than gracious enough. If they want me to act ignorant, I will. I was here first, and I ain't going anywhere. 
Hey, yo, man, chill. They just called the police. Get your fucking man, we weren't doing shit, man. Get that camera out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Our enforcers will run up on you, and the first instinct is to be like, why are you coming at me? But I didn't do anything. This is what mattered. We'll get the money. I promise. I live here. What are you doing here? Why can't y'all just leave us alone? Fix your house, and we will. No disrespect to any race or everything, but this was a black community. We don't got a lot of black faces around here. So my kids grow up, he's gonna be shook. He ain't gonna know. The friction that is found there is the feeling that I'm trying to describe and explain. And we just finished the modeling class. It's nice. The neighbors don't want us here. They try to intimidate us all the time, like remodeling your house is a bad thing. We just want the neighborhood to be beautiful. They don't break it down from a particular situation or standpoint to say, okay, maybe you know you had a trouble life. Maybe you didn't get the help that you needed. Maybe you didn't have proper guidance in your life. Maybe you had no one around you to connect with properly. No, it had to be your mental you know, disability. It had to be your inability to cope with society. Now, if you keep calling them, I'm gonna call somebody on you. My grandson ain't done nothing to you. I have never done nothing to you. Now you stay out of my business, you understand, son? Welcome back. Raphael, you open the film with the killing of Safi. You go back and recount the events that lead up to it. And while you're doing that, you use a mix of styles or, or filmmaking strategies. There's documentary footage, there's uh, narrative scenes you've put into it, there's even direct address where a, ca a character will step out of the scene and actually address the audience. You know, it just kind of got me thinking a little bit about um, the history of different styles of docudrama. Uh, earlier we were just chatting about Godard and the early days of the French New Wave. I also thought a lot about the Italian neorealists after the war when you know things were in a very difficult uh, state and they were like, how do we do this? Well, we won't use actors because we don't have them. We'll just use real people and create some scenes. Um, this got me thinking as I looked at the film, Raphael must really be a student of the form and really have some strong opinions and thoughts about the cinematic space and the way he wants to put it together. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, theoretically, there's a lot of theoretical research behind the film in terms of um, not only social sciences, um, geography, but also um, the film form itself and film history. And um, mo for the most part, uh, a lot of my cinematic style was um, influenced by three sources. The first one would be Bertolt Brecht and Brechtian cinema. Yes, which would de we, we could say uh, the idea of direct address turning out in the scene was a very uh, uh, signature moment in the epic theater of Brecht where the actor would step outside of character and comment on what the character has just done. Yeah, essentially breaking the fourth wall yes. is what it's called. And um, also his agitprop mode of agitating the spectator in order to promote or propagate a new way of looking at, at the social realities that we are in. Yeah. And um, the film in that sense is not meant to you know make you feel good it's meant to agitate the spectator to promote a discussion after the film and i think a lot of people sometimes have a trouble kind of understanding that mm. um so that's that's the first form and and might i mention that agitprop and bertolt brechtian aesthetics was also adopted by el teatro campesino the first yes. form of chicano theater which yes. led to the chicano cinematic movement which was um, practicing what I call Rascuache aesthetics. And Rascuache aesthetics is making the most at the littlest means. And I think it's very imperative that a lot of independent filmmakers understand this. And this is something that's part of my research and some of my future publications, which I plan on coming out with. Mm -hmm. um, but also, 
and most importantly, I would say, in my opinion, the third cinema movement of the 1960s and 70s, which was first born in Argentina and Latin America and then spread to Asia and Africa, mm -hmm. um, was probably the most influential source of cinematic history that has influenced a lot of my work. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, what they do is they talk about how neocolonialism can take many different types of forms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I bring up the idea of internal colonialism, people think that these ideas are outdated. Why are you studying? Or there couldn't be that happening yeah. in a country like ours. Exactly. But when you look at the Trail of Tears, if you look at the Japanese internment, mm -hmm. the Mexican repatriation, mm -hmm. and even the Native American uh, reservation mm -hmm. system, you'll see that internal colonialism is very alive and well. So how does third cinema thinking fit into that? Mm -hmm. Well, third cinema oftentimes is relegated just to uh, the third world, yeah. right? But if we really look at the first world, we'll see that these same practices are being developed here in mm -hmm. terms of globalization, for instance, is yeah. another example of it. But also, um, it, 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 if you look at communities of color and gentrification and how they're being pushed out of the urban centers mm -hmm. into the, to further out of the city, their access to resources and, mm -hmm. and health care and also mental and psychological state mm -hmm. is really what's important because a lot of people don't think of gentrification as a health issue. Um, and if they do, they usually think of it in terms of access to health care. Mm -hmm. But in reality, and this is with the foundation of the research behind the film from uh, one of my colleagues and mentors, uh, Professor Frederick Murphy of the Morehouse School of Medicine and the CDC, mm -hmm. was one of my main collaborators in the film. And he, based in his research, which I based a lot of my, my research on, was um, the idea of the psychology of displacement and okay. how the psychology of displacement actually produces mental illness in the form of alienation and disorientation. So a lot of the strategies in terms of breaking the fourth wall in yeah. the film yeah. are meant to share that same alienation with the audience. Right, so the filmmaking in this regard almost becomes a visual way of representing a state of being or a condition that people are actually living in. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like it's a big part of third uh, third filmmaking in that way. Mm -hmm. So you're mixing color, black and white, sound effect, soundtrack. Often um, you, you will cut in a certain sort of uh, uh, rhythm that follows a narrative and then you'll, you'll jar us out of it with a moment. And uh, so I'm gonna suppose all of this goes into the idea of helping us see film in a different way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, no, yeah, definitely seeing film in a different way as a tool to really uh, promote action and to promote discussion, I think is really it's important because we can discuss this as yeah. much as we want, but if we don't actually yeah. act upon it, then the fruits of my labor are really in vain. It's, it's interesting you talk about um, part of the film itself is meant to not end when the film ends, but to actually promote an event after the film that's a community event. And that is something I think that's really a powerful notion. You know, we're so used to uh, in the uh, 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 corporate world of cinema, you go to a movie, you watch the film, the credits roll, the lights come up, it's as if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It was two hours where you went somewhere and then you went back to your life as it was. You're talking about a kind of filmmaking that actually says the film itself is not isolated. It's not just a piece that you can observe and walk away from. It's a part of something and it's speaking mm -hmm. to you in that way as a member of the community yeah. to take action. Mm -hmm. Is that something that um, uh, uh, when you reference the history of Teatro Campesino, et cetera, is that something that when they did their theater pieces was also part of, you know, the way they made those was, was part of it to get the audience, the live audience afterwards to stay and actually talk about the piece? Absolutely. So uh, in Teatro Campesino, it was actually used as uh, internal mechanism for the United Farm Workers Movement in Cesar Chavez, and that led to the... the lib uh, the, em the empowerment of the working class uh, Mexican community and Chicana community in the fields in order to secure uh, equal wages, um, benefits, and in general, just uh, a state of human condition which okay. is um, equitable yeah. and uh, according to the Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, so your company and your uh, organization um, you're setting up a kind of uh, template, a kind of uh, role model in a way, if you will, for po potential and possibility in communities. Mm -hmm. um, what are we supposed to do? I'm just sitting here thinking, geez, this is, talking to Raphael, I'm, 
you know, I never really thought about this, but I can probably help get some cameras into that neighborhood. Is that, yeah. is that something from your point of view as a filmmaker you're also trying to promote? Get those voices uh, happening. Let young people feel like this isn't something that you have to have a Panavision camera and a, and a grip truck, an electric truck to go out and do something that you can actually uh, tell your stories with very little. How do you do that with your organization? Yeah, so the organization was born in 2006. I co-founded it with a, a fellow musician and I actually started as a musician and then couldn't support myself as a musician and had to switch over to filmmaking. And um, together we collaborated and, and the vision was to create workshops um, that were hosted by several community centers all across Seattle and uh -huh. it was born in the Central District. And Right now, we um, have expanded to the Bay Area, Oakland, and San Francisco, and mm -hmm. also Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we'd like to uh, establish offices and satellites all across the West Coast, mm -hmm. from Canada to Mexico, because I'm a tri-citizen and I can actually own property in Canada and Mexico. So what would be the kinds of things, if I'm a teenage uh, kid growing up in some of those communities and I came to your organization or mm -hmm. you know, I showed up and volunteered for you to help you make uh, a mm -hmm. film, what would I learn? How would you... Mm -hmm. How would you sort of uh, make what you're talking about palpable and real for them? Uh, well, it's funny that you ask that because right now I'm currently working in uh, East Oakland for a nonprofit called Youth Uprising, and okay. that's essentially what we're doing. And it's a multi-million dollar facility that's created um, through public funding and private funding, and also grants um, to empower the youth in a really depressed uh, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And Essentially, I've been using them as a model for my own company because they're operating on a much larger scale. Yeah. And what I would say to some of the youth that are interested in, and I have had youth from Eastern Washington actually reach out to me. And I mean, as a filmmaker, I always think it's important to um, engage the youth yeah. that, that come and reach out to you because yeah. that is the future. And I think that if I were to say, hey, why don't you come work on one of our productions, which I have done, yeah. um, I would say, let's take it to the streets. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna show you how to make guerrilla filmmaking. Okay. I'm gonna show you if you can't afford permits. Yeah. If you can't afford cameras, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna show, show you how, how to do this. this exactly. And making the most of the littlest means, which is the whole Chicano aesthetic that came yeah. out of El Teatro Campesino, with literally taking signs and saying, "This is my character's name," and putting it around my neck, because it's more important that the ideas that you communicate are more important than the glossy aesthetics that you present. And I think in a lot of film schools, we often get distracted by this spectacle. Of course. I mean, I think that. Some, some of the problem is, uh, you know, as a teacher myself, I encounter a lot of this sense of, you know, what's most interesting is the look and the form mm -hmm. rather than the content, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm constantly saying, doesn't matter how good it looks or sounds if the content and the thinking and the purpose behind it doesn't have integrity, doesn't have, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hasn't been thought through, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic that in today's age, uh, like I said, with YouTube and everything else out there, I mean, there's video everywhere, but isn't it interesting? The percentage of it that has good content is still small. Absolutely. And if you go to Hollywood, even the, the mainstream audience and, and producers and, and film industry will tell you story, story, story. story. Yeah. So yeah. that's not really something that is just unique to independent filmmaking yeah. or Green Eyed Media, but yeah. it, it's really something that all filmmakers know and, and promote. And I think that, yeah. I tell you, the thing that's really exciting about what you're saying is you know, I don't know how many students have said to me, yeah, I wrote this or yeah, I did this, but I can't do it because I don't have enough equipment or whatever. Mm -hmm. This notion of saying don't use that as a barrier, use it as an aesthetic is Same. revolutionary and brilliant mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. What's next for you, Raphael? What's, uh, what's happening film-wise for you? Yeah, um, so I'm working on a lot of projects right now. Um, the ones that are probably most relevant to Seattle would be um, the autobiography of Aaron Dixon, well, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. Um, he's approached me and he wants to turn his autobiography into a, a documentary mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to try to use the same docudrama aesthetic um, to try to communicate uh, the legacy of the Black Panther Party in Seattle. But uh, more recently, than other than that, I'm also going to be releasing a film in about two to three months called The Blank Canvas, Hip Hop Struggle for Representation in Seattle, which essentially explores every facet of hip hop culture from fashion to graffiti mm -hmm. to music mm -hmm. to uh, DJs and producers, to the ra even to the radio industry, mm -hmm. um, to really explore the struggle of independent artists here in hip hop, uh, in the hip hop community here in Seattle, mm -hmm. and um, to see investigate why hasn't uh, Seattle really adopted a a very definitive type of identity within the larger hip hop community, 
and, and how it's perceived to be a blank canvas. But in reality, there's so many colors being painted on that canvas that it's a collage of so many different diverse voices. Th that's a really interesting statement because depending on who you talk to, you'll either hear why hasn't Seattle uh, made its mark in the hip hop community? You can't identify a Northwest hip hop. But then there are other people who say that's not true. Mm -hmm. It is. We just haven't gotten the attention that the LA, Chicago, New York, you know, Bay Area people have. And mm -hmm. Uh, that's been the problem. So it'll be interesting to see what you find out as you do this. Absolutely, and it's going to be marketed just like 23rd and Union with the soundtrack and all the information can be available on greenidemedia.com. Great. So last question. Mm -hmm. I am a young filmmaker from perhaps a depressed neighborhood and I have dreams of telling stories. You know, this is my chance to say to you, Raphael, a role model, what do I do now? I don't, I don't, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just out here in the middle of nowhere. What should I do? I would say, first of all, especially to a lot of my students, I say they don't want you in the film industry. That you are a marginal identity. They do not want those voices being made uh, in the mainstream. And I would say, if you're like me and you like to resist and you like to rebel and you like to go against the system, mm -hmm. then you have an obligation to make these stories and to share them with the world. And that's what I would say to youth, and I'd also say that don't think of it in terms of money, because money will come. Just do what you love, and mm -hmm. money will follow. That's really inspirational, Raphael. Thank you very much, and thank you for being on Backstory with me right. today. Thank you. And thank you for watching Backstory. I'm Andrew Tsao, and we'll see you again behind the scenes.